I started Kendo in, uh, in Montreal in 1989. Um, I was uh, I, I spent most of my life in Quebec City, as a matter of fact. Um, um, and uh, pretty early on, I I, st- I was doing judo. So like for 15 years or so, from five year old or four year old, very really really early on. Um, until uh, about 18 years old, and I passed my uh, my shodan uh, in judo. Uh, I was pretty good at it, I think, um, competitively speaking. And uh, I, I guess the track was set for me to continue in that direction. And and um, you know, once uh, certainly at the time when you when you were young and you passed uh, that quickly, you kind of fast tracked into some kind of Olympic idea. You know, you start training in, in, in competitive environments and you start to put on muscles and stuff like that. And I didn't like that. So I, I it wasn't kind of my, 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 my interest to, I was just doing judo because it was fun. Uh, and I was 17, 18 years old. So, you know, things that, uh, that, that I liked to do didn't quite mesh with uh, the training required in judo, competitive judo. So I stopped coincided that, that coincided with uh, me moving to Montreal for university and uh, to go to university in uh, university in Moya and uh, and there's a Kendo dojo there uh, that was anyway and uh, a few months after reaching there I saw a cool looking poster of these guys in armor and wow it was really cool I'd never seen that before even in Quebec um, I'd heard of it but didn't know what it was uh, I joined and um, it it was really uh, it, that's when it started. Um, an inter- a funny anecdote on that is is when I um, when I was I remember signing up for the class and um, you know you sign up and there's like there were twenty or thirty other students. It's basically a, a an intake from that year's semester essentially that that joined. And the sensei was there in, in the registration booth or whatever it was, and and I said, and he said, and I asked him, you know, what do you, what do you wear? What do I have to wear? He said, well, if you have any uh, sweatpants, or if you have any um, other martial art, karate or judo gi, you can wear that for the first class. That's cool. So I said, yeah, that's cool because I, I have a judo judo gi. So he's like, all right, bring it, bring it. So I show up at the at the uh, first class uh, with all this whole whole set of people there, uh, and I'm dressed up in my judo gi with the only belt that I had. And that didn't go down too well. <laughs> There's a black belt, <laughs> so you don't show up in a, in a, in in your first class of anything with a black belt on. That that, that from that day on, the, the sensei was like, "Okay, this guy is, uh, is trouble." So I, uh, that was my introduction. He uh, they they, they uh, put me through the, uh, the the ringer back then because uh, when when uh, having done judo for so long, you know, the footwork and all that stuff was quite um, easy for me to pick up. So so I was. Pretty lucky early on. I had a good couple of teachers there, and I and I, I developed pretty well, pretty quickly. Um, anyway, uh, so long story short, uh, after five years or so, five six years in Montreal, I, I moved to Japan. I lived there for uh, for five years, five and a half years. Um, I worked in uh, in a very Japanese company, NTT. Um, and uh, I worked, uh, I, I went there for work. I didn't go there for Kendo. And um, so you and were working in telecommunications? And what part I got, of that? Um, well, I was a, a, a graduate engineer. I, uh, I had graduated in, a, in engineer, physics engineering, uh, but I had some interest and I had uh, done diplomas and other stuff in uh, project management. Um, so I got accepted as a as a Kenshu uh, uh, intern on an internship at NTT in a, in a multimedia business department at the headquarters. Um, it really, uh, it was really hard. Even in retrospect, uh, it's it was hard to kind of understand what my role was there. Um, I think. Well, I don't want to dwell too much on that but i mean the 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 organization was looking at the outside of japan and they thought bringing on uh, interns like this from outside of japan would help kind of giving a a perspective on the state of the internet at the time which was really new in japan certainly so we were involved in product product development marketing uh, content development all kinds of things 
Uh, but we were working the Japanese way. I mean, I was the only white guy, the only Japanese, non-Japanese guy in that company, certainly in the, in the building. Um, but I was working, uh, you know, the Japanese hours and the, 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 the don't leave the office until the boss is left. And when he leaves, if he grabs you for a beer, you go out and you have a beer with the boss. So uh, all these excuses to say that I actually didn't practice that much kendo in Japan when I was there. That was probably the period of my life where I practiced the least kendo of all things. Uh, however sad, sad that may sound. Um, was, was there any, did your participation in judo and kendo prepare you in any way for that kind of work culture? No, um, it, the other, it's the other way around. Is my interest uh, and my, I guess, approach to uh, people and things and stress and discipline uh, which was already quite aligned with the, um, the, the that way of thinking or that way of doing, which brought me into judo and into kendo, or made, made me stay there and in, eventually gravitate or uh, feel compelled to apply on in an internship. And luckily enough to get it, not a complete surprise, but anyway, uh, I'll keep that for for, for another uh, story. But and 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 and, and ending up. Um, extending my internship from what it was initially supposed to be from six months to three years. So, I mean, they, they, they didn't believe that I was interested in continuing beyond the first six months. No proper gaijin likes to work in a company like this, but I quite enjoyed it because it fit really my, my, uh, my view of, you know, work and uh, doing things. So um, but I did, I did, uh, on, on my first day there, I asked the HR department to um, to help me find the, the dojo because each company over there has at least one company dojo. Entity certainly being one of the big, well, the big powerhouse in Kendo in Japan. I, I was assuming the dojo was in the basement, but no, it was real far away in Tokyo, the other side of the, of the city. So that didn't make it easy to, to go there eventually. Um, and going there, you go there, you're the Again, the only foreigner, and my kendo wasn't all that good, really, uh, compared to anybody there. And so, the, the the cultural fit was was really difficult in kendo. And at work, it was it went very well, but in kendo, it was really hard, and probably a lot because of my inability to speak Japanese at the time and my just general incompetence in kendo. You know compared to the, those people there. So I, I didn't go there as much as I should have training. Um, I uh, met up one day, I don't remember how that happened with uh, Taro Ariga Sensei, who at the same time he was there uh, at IBM, he had set up a dojo there and he was quite, uh, I mean, I'd known him for many, many years before, uh, having had a lot of exchanges with, uh, with Toronto when I was uh, in Montreal. Um, so meeting, so I met with him and, and practiced at his dojo a few times, uh, uh, I would say a few times a month, maybe certainly having a lot of, uh, uh after kendo practices, if you know what I mean? Uh, if you know, Taro. um, and, um, uh, that kind of helped me keep up a little bit, some standard, you know, develop a little more. And, uh, yeah, and so that, that was because of the, the under the language and also like, he he knows where he came from, so he was a little more lenient in how like you're accepted into the dojo. Yeah, certainly a lot more comfortable. Um, and and I remember they had uh, like once a month an open like everybody comes from wherever you are, whoever you are, whatever you your skills are, and so you'd have you know all the miserable foreigners like me <laughs> show up and have a good time. Um, so I remember, I remember that that was a thing and yeah, so, so certainly a lot more, uh, welcoming for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so that was, uh, so yeah, I, I stayed at Tantiti for three years and I moved to Yokohama, worked for another company there for a couple of years. Um, and then decided to leave and went, lived in California for three years. Um, a side note to preempt the question that's coming soon, I expect. Um, I met my wife, my, my, my wife, my only wife, <laughs> um, my Trinidadian wife in Japan. Uh, we met a few years 
in yeah my second third year in Japan and she left and she continued st- she went to study in uh, in the states and eventually we uh, when I left Japan we both agreed to kind of meet up in California so we kind of stayed in touch we weren't married obviously uh, stayed in touch met in California and eventually got married in California um, so in California we met up we were in uh, in Silicon Valley I was working in I was working in um, in Mountain View, we I were I went to the uh, to a dojo in uh, San Jose in Mountain View. Uh, Yamaguchi Sensei was a nice old guy, uh, very uh, friendly, very um, willing to, um, to to delegate his tasks. Um, so because at the time, at that point, after five years, I was pretty good in Japanese, so he kind of felt okay. Here's a guy that can help me. So he gave me a lot to do and, and help me uh, get more involved in the instruction side of Kendo. So that's really when I started figuring out how, how teaching works. And because before that, and even up until that point, it was quite low grade. I must've been like Nidan or Sandan if so much, I'm not sure. So he had, uh, he had found that instead of having to translate what he knows into English, he could just use Japanese on you and then have you translate kind of that message. Yeah, I guess so. Um, it, it, you know, it, it was a small dojo. Um, it was a, um, it was not, I, 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 in retrospect, I think that may not have been the kind of thing he wanted to do. I, I, I can't really assume there, but um, he was, teaching, but without an actual um, drive to teach. Because, you know, when, when you're put in a position, and, and now I know, when you're put in a position of um, being a sensei, it doesn't mean you're qualified to be it or you've asked to be it. You just happen to be there and you got to do it the best you can. So here comes this guy who, who knows a thing or two, who can, as you say, kind of translate ideas that I'm trying to teach people. And he, he, and I was quite at that point, still am quite, um, what, what's the word? Uh, I'm, I'm easy going with, I'm not, I'm not hard to deal with, with Japanese people. You know, I kind of get it. I kind of get the, 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 group, the mood and, and what it, what is, uh, you know, general feeling of what is being tried, what is tried, what is, uh, trying to be communicated or trying to be uh, said. Um, and so, I mean, I'm, I'm easy like that with uh, with a Japanese sensei, it's, it's quite natural. And so anyway, so yeah, he probably thought, okay, let's let's use him to, for the time he's here to, to share the knowledge. And so that, that was quite fun. It's a small dojo though, and I'm not even sure if it still exists, but probably still does. Um, so be, but, before, we, yeah. I was just going to say, coincidentally, that's the first time I saw Naginata. There was quite a lot. There's probably more people doing Naginata there than Kendo. I'm mentioning this because I know that on your channel you you cover that as well. So I found that oh, this, I didn't know what it was first of all, and I thought, well, that's pretty interesting. Uh, so before we have, move on from this part. Um, we like to think about like in life, we have these different phases from like a child to student to adult and then taking on more responsibility. But we have these phases in our kendo, uh, our Budo lives too. So you had your early days uh, in Montreal um, and then you went to Japan and you went to California. Could you talk about maybe those different stops along the way? What changed in terms of what kendo meant to you in your life and how you related to it? That's an interesting question. I should take notes of that because uh, I didn't realize just that as you're mentioning it, how how um, accurate that may be. Um, so for sure, uh, my first, uh, let's say a chunk of five years being in Montreal, uh, I was uh, obsessed with it. Um, I trained like a maniac um, with everybody that I could train. I went to as many times as I could train to Toronto, which was the main um, hub close to where I, where I was. I mean, in the days, Montreal was close to nothing. I mean, there, there was quite a lot of uh, dojo and people, but the level was very low. Anyway, uh, and, I, and I was quite obsessed with it. And I saw it as, uh, you know, that's, I, 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 I was quite, a, I don't know what's the right word for that, but I was, uh, 
I didn't understand people who were not obsessed with it. I was aggressive about it. I was like, there's only, you got to train really hard and you got to push, push, push. And, you know, that, that guy in the dojo that's just like obsessed. I was that guy. And, um, and, then, and then going to Japan, uh, I barely, barely trained compared to that. And um, I, I think that was an overall pause in Kendo for me and develop other aspects of my life. And probably in retrospect, I, it's good representation. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, Kendo for me is not um, the one and only thing. I've got plenty of other occupations and activities and interests. Uh, it certainly is a huge part of my life, but it's not the only thing. Um, and I think having been to Japan for a while, taking a break somewhat from Kendo, that kind of represents that. And then the few years in California, certainly that was uh, really interesting because I was pushed into um, um, into into the 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 I was forced into thinking, what's this idea of teaching Kendo to non Japanese? Uh, after um, San Jose, I went to San Diego for a couple of years, less than two years. But I was practicing at UCSD, big big Kendo dojo there. And again, was encouraged as well by Yamamoto Sensei to, to, to help out and to, 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 to give out advice. And it was, it was at the time, certainly I'm sure it is very, uh, a very open dojo where people share a lot and the more senior students kind of help out and get very involved. Um, so I was kind of forced to look at Kendo from a different perspective. The, the, the idea of, okay, it's not just all about you. It's about creating this kind of environment uh, constructive to teaching or constructive to learning, I should say. And, and how do you do that as a teacher, as an instructor? And, um, yeah, so, so, and with, with always constantly in mind, how do you teach non-Japanese? I'll say even non-Asians to an extent, you know, Western, the Western white guy, typically, um, who's in the mid twenties, 30s, 35 years old, it's a different, you have to approach things from a different way, um, certainly because of the age and certainly because of the, the, the upbringing is very often very different. So that got me thinking right away from, from the, that's the California era in my life there. Yeah? And that, all of that applies eventually to, to where I am now. Well, that's always an interesting because I'm, I'm hearing that a lot more from senior practitioners and instructors outside of Japan, this need to be able to adapt to whatever local culture and upbringing of the students. Uh, but it's also interesting to see that, um, that that adaptation of teaching didn't exist when they started. For example, when you started in Montreal, you were probably being taught by a very traditional kind of set. And then when you moved to Japan, you had to face that as well. So... How do you decide what to incorporate from that upbringing? Because that's all you, that's what, how you brought up and it didn't stop you from doing kendo. And how do, how do you decide what to take in and what to adapt and change? Uh, yeah, uh, that's, a, that's a whole uh, thesis right there. Um, so I, I, can't, I can't answer the question uh, on, a, uh, on a theoretical level. Um, I, I'll just explain um, well, I'll share what, what I've tried to do now that uh, I'm forced to do it um, in the country here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, there's, first of all, let's, let's, let me state right off the bat, there's no way that uh, it makes sense to copy and paste a method that you've learned, or that I've learned, um, to my environment here. I think uh, not because the culture is different, just simply because you shouldn't, you shouldn't. So one can do teaching has evolved tremendously. Um, I, I was telling my wife the other day, you know, in Latin America, where I'm close to now, um, in Europe, um, and it's many, many places still in Canada and the US, the the technique of teaching, the, the sports science aspect of teaching, 
and the curriculum development is so far behind what it currently is in Japan, for example, and what it is also in certain dojos in, uh, I'm sure in Toronto, certainly in California, uh, really Kendo dojos, right? I can't speak for other martial arts, uh, where things have improved a lot because people evolved and people follow the, um, the, uh, the, the information produced in Japan. But unfortunately, that information is only in Japanese 99% of the time, and it's well-guarded, I suppose. Uh, so the teaching methods haven't evolved as much as they should have, I think. Uh, certainly, the, everything I see around me tells me that. So, so that's not right, and it shouldn't be that, that way. So to your point, um, I don't think it's a good idea for me to copy and paste what the way I've learned, what I've learned, the way I've learned it, to my environment here. Um, I've tried it, as a matter of fact. Uh, my first few years in Trinidad, I just taught what I was taught the same way. Um, and I was taught uh, pretty traditional, as you say, um, from, uh, by guys who, who learned um, very, um, very the old ways, the old traditional hard ways, you know, repeat, 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 harder, harder, uh, no pain, no gain type of mentality. And um, so doing it uh, here didn't work at all because uh, one, there is a cultural aspect to that. And number two, there's, you know, it, coincidentally, the people who want to learn kendo here, as in many, many other places, are in their 20s mid to late twenties or, or, or older at that point, um, there's a reason why they join and there's, they already have their, their brain is pretty formed at the, as it is. So their way, the way they do things, the way they think through things is already pretty set. If you don't recognize that, then you're going to be very lonely in a dojo within a day or two, because it's not going to work. I've seen it and I've tested it and uh, I've tested that assumption and I've tested the fix and the fix works. I mean, you have to adapt the, um, your, your, your curriculum to, to the people around you. So um, to kind of go back to, to, to your point, how do we um, adjust uh, there's so many components to the question. Um, it depends, essentially, it depends on the objective that you have. If you're teaching kids, it's one thing. If you're teaching adults, it's another thing. If you're at the beginning stages of uh, development of an uh, organization, as I am here, um, the priorities are different. So my goal is not to turn a bunch of people into world champions or competitive competitors. Uh, as a priority, my, 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 role, my objective here is to set a baseline, set a foundation on which I can rely then uh, to start expanding. So developing people who will be able to teach who have the right fundamentals and have the right mindset to, uh, to then eventually take on some responsibilities to start teaching, um, to develop people who have the interest in order to help out the dojo or the organization in terms of finance, in terms of marketing, in terms of promotion, blah, blah, blah. Um, so, and, and then in, in parallel to that, try to find a way to develop the, the, the technical skills, the Kendall skills, so that there's not just a recreational environment, but also a semi-competitive people who kind of push the envelope and, and get uh, other people excited. Um, uh, it's all these things that you need to consider with um, in the background, the idea that, okay, you're like, in my case, you're not in Japan, you're not in a culture that um, is familiar with the discipline, the, 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 the art itself, um, and is, has its own socioeconomic realities and cultural realities. Uh, you don't consider any of that. Um, you'll be very lonely in the dojo. I've, I've tried it and it's, pretty clear yeah so and and as like one of the only people with experience on the island 
um, you have to kind of, you have to be very, um, I guess, what's the term? Like you said, priorities. You have to be very specific on what is it that you want to achieve. So one of the, one of the things that in, in like, say, a big metropolitan area, one where it has lots of kind of practitioners, you could say, oh, you're a student that wants to compete with the best. So why don't you go to that dojo or work with that sensei who does that? Oh, you're just a casual person. Why don't you work with this sensei? So in this case, you have to trade off. You have to decide what kind of students do I try to nurture here because you can't have both. Yeah. So how have you made that decision over time? Well, what, well again, what have you seen? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it, it's again, you, you're guided. You have to be guided what with, with, with the ultimate objective is. So to, to kind of go back a little bit in the history, just to, so, 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 so you're clear as to what I'm, uh, as to my environment. So I, I moved here in 2003, 2004, the end of 2003, with my wife. Um, and there, so Trinidad and Tobago is a very small country, 1.4 million population, more or less, um, in the Caribbean. The last island at the bottom of the, in the Caribbean islands, we could see Venezuela from here. It's quite down south. Um, there was no uh, kendo when I came here. Um, there were a few people who um, claimed to do yaido, yaijutsu. Um, but not really, but, you know, uh, in the, in the vacuum, you know, what happens. Um, but, uh, the, but the, um, the history of karate, judo is quite set here. There's, so there's some background, some knowledge of martial arts. Um, unfortunately, um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of underqualified, um, sensei here. Um, because, uh, gotta watch out when I say, <laughs> uh, just a lack of experience and exposure to, um, to, to being taught essentially. Um, yeah, so I'll keep it at that. There's the, 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 the standard for martial art is, is a little low. Um, certainly was when I, when I came here. Uh, there's a lot of fake stuff, uh, all, made, all made up stuff, but there's a lot of legit people as well. And there's a lot of interest in, in martial arts. There's a lot of interest in sword arts, um, movies and all that stuff. You know, people have seen them. And when I came to Trinidad uh, and I, did, I didn't have a work permit, so I had a year without occupation, let's put it this way. So um, I, one day I went to the local dojo around the corner, karate dojo, and asked the sensei, is it okay for me to just gear up? And he had the nice big mirrors, a nice floor. Can I use your floor? Is it okay to just for me to practice? I like, sure, no problem. So I started doing that, and pretty soon a lot of people start asking, oh, so you teach kendo? And I'm, no, I don't teach kendo. I'm not a sensei, and I don't teach kendo. I'm not I'm just here for myself. And then keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. And eventually, um, I, um, I, I, well, that's, I guess it's a, an anecdote on that, but um, a couple of guys were keep harassing me, wanting to, to teach them. And I don't feel I'm qualified nor expected to, to teach. I wouldn't even know where to start. And one day I tell them, well, look, if you come back next week, Saturday, with 10 guys, then, then I'll teach. Thinking, you know, there's no way that's going to happen, right? And so said, so done. Next week, Saturday, 10 guys show up and they say, hey, we're here. You said. So So I, got, I was caught there. So I had to start, to start teaching them. So uh, interestingly enough, and you could cut that off from the podcast if you want. But um, interestingly enough, um, I, I heard that story from the other side years after from one of those 10 guys who, who explained um, that um, one day, one of, one of them was walking around and, and then saw me practicing and went in his neighborhood and called his friends and said, hey guys, I need the sense. He told me that if I bring 10 guys, he's gonna teach us. So you, you gotta come, you gotta come and, and join. So he's going around his neighborhood asking his friends to, to, to come. And then they're nine or something like that. They need one more. And there's this guy on the side, they say, hey, come, come, you know, he's like, they barely know him. 
And so he's telling me, that 10th guy telling me the story years later. He said, they asked me to come, and I didn't know what it was. I didn't want to do kendo. I didn't know nothing about it. And uh, But anyway, I went anyway, so the 10 of them show up. Well, the, that 10th guy is the only guy that's still doing kendo to this day. And all the other ones, obviously, first, uh, first second class, they were all already gone. They were fed up with kendo. That guy that, that is awesome. I, I, <laughs> I actually, I'm getting to the point where I don't believe that these things are accidents. There's something <laughs> that it just happens and... Yeah, that's so awesome. Cool. So um, anyway, um, moving on from that. Um, yeah, so I, I that's how it started and started very small and basic. And I it took me um, five or six years easily to, to kind of put things together as to, OK, how do I run this thing? Where What are the priorities? Where do I want to go with this? Uh, I knew I was going to be here for the long term. I was, I was not in Trinidad to be go for a short period. I knew I was. I had my, made my set, made my mind, set my mind that um, I was going to, or I was hoping to live here for forever with my wife. She's happy to be here, obviously. She's from here. So it was a long-term idea. So I started early on trying to put, in, put the pieces, the foundational pieces together. Uh, but the problem, as I alluded to earlier, was I started teaching the same way I've learned which is long, tedious, repetitive, boring um, practice. And that didn't go down too well. <clears throat> that was, um, well, people stopped coming, essentially. You know, they, the, uh, that, that was the only reason. There was no other reason than the fact that it wasn't quite, I, I guess, motivating for people to continue. And certainly not what they expected. So there's, so we have the same uh, attrition in, in Trinidad as, as other countries around the world. There's a lot of influx, people coming in, having this image of what kendo is going to be, often driven by TV or anime or whatever. And when they realize, oh, no, it's actually pretty hard, um, then they drop off. And then there's many, many levels of, of attrition at different periods, you know, when they put on the bogu and so on and so forth. So it's the same. Um, but with an added, in, in, uh, an added incentive, incentive to drop out in my case, which was okay. I mean, I hadn't at all considered the, 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 the people I was teaching to and the socioeconomic environment, cultural environment. So the attrition was brutal. I mean, people would not stay at all. And despite, you know, it was easy going, it was friendly, you know, we'd have beers, we'd talk, it'd be kind of fun but the practice itself was kind of tough so it took me a little while to realize that um and then um once i did uh started looking at adjustments in the in the method of teaching um uh, by method i mean really the um the curriculum essentially you know if it, going at it a little less intense i mean also to to be fair what i learned was uh based on my how obsessed i was i was with kendo at the time in montreal so it was quite competitive kendo quite hard and and you know um and 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 took me a little while to realize well there's at least half the population not interested in competitive just want to do you know kendo for the fun of it uh so the curriculum has to be adapted to that um it sounds obvious, but um, at the time when you're thrown in that situation without any uh, guidance, uh, any, um, I, I, I had no sensei to guide me, to tell me, give me advice other than what I remembered from way back then. Um, there was no documentation. There was no information. There's certainly no YouTube. There's certainly no uh, nothing like that. So I had to figure it out and adjust accordingly. So um, focus a little more on the recreational side of Kendo. So a little less, the tem a little slower tempo. Um, focus a little more on, on um, you know, keeping things interesting, you know, not always do the same technique for months and months and months, you know, look at, yeah. 
and also variants and whatnot. Um, different um, uh, activities, you know, we thinking about um, uh, looking at videos or, or, or discussing certain things or um, doing kata uh, or a little more. Um, so things like that to, uh, to keep the interest um, as high as it could be. Um, also, um, well, there's another big change that I made, um, which is um, that traditionally I was I, I was thinking, okay, well, you want to learn Kendo, come as you are. Uh, you're by yourself. If you're interested, come. We'll I'll, we'll start. You'll we'll, you'll join the group and I'll go as we'll go as as uh, you know as as you can. Um, and um, I realized because there was always people always interested constantly. They'd come, you know, one person, two person, three people. They'd come and I'd, I'd let them join and from today or from next week or whatever. And that did not work. And I was wondering why do people, everyone drops out? So listen to advice from other, from students of mine and decided to say, no, you cannot come. We are having a beginner's class starting next month or next whenever. On that day, then you can come and bring other people and, so uh, the idea of a, of a class that is dedicated to beginners and more importantly, a group of people and not one person or two people. So that was in my mind, revolutionary. Of course, that, that's how I started Kendo. I didn't think of that. Um, and that was, that was a game changer because basically now we had uh, our focus, my focus was strictly on beginners, um, and then they would join as a group, so it was less intimidating for them, and there would be like more, uh, you know, bonding within each other, and so, and, and that's how it's done successfully in all the universities and all the larger groups. And I don't understand why I didn't think of that earlier, but turns out that's what it took to get people to join in greater groups, stay for longer, because then we say it's a three-month thing, so that's another um, change. It's not that you join as a group and you stay until you're 85 or 90 years old. You join. Uh, there's a three-month program dedicated to beginners. At the end of three months, there's a little exam and you pose a little certificate and you get your 8Q or 7Q or 6Q. And uh, you've learned to do uh, kirikaishi or something like that, right? Something very, very simple. And the uh, retention rate was very high and has been very high. So if we start, say, with 20 people, which is a lot of people in this part of the world, um, depending on the situation, we end up after three months with between five and 10 people, which is really, really, really good. Of course, after the three months, then there's only one left. I, I mean, once they got the paper and um, the, summit, the session is done, they don't really continue on. Some continue, but that at least for that period of time, you know, the 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 they've learned something. Uh, they mentioned it to their family, so it's a, it's kind of a marketing ploy, if you may. Uh, it pays for the rent, um, and and uh, you know, some people continue. So that's that's been very help, helpful. This is kind of thing that I've had to do to compromise, if you may, or adjust a little bit. So you were mentioning that these things were you just didn't realize what was happening where you came from to how the, like the beginner's class and coming in groups. Um, did you, was there any adjustment as well in terms of the type of people, in terms of the culture of the island that you had to get used to that probably because as someone that also moved there, you had to get adjusted in your regular life as well, like interacting with society or doing work. Did you notice anything that from what you were learning from just living on in Trinidad and Tobago, that you could then move into how you brought Kendo to the island as well? So, um, for me to move, when I moved here, I, I, there was no, um, personally anyway, there was no cultural um, shock or anything like that. Um, I keep telling people, you know, when, after you've, um, 
you've uh, were dropped in Japan and had to work in one of the most traditional companies in Japan, um, not speaking the language and basically you're on your own. After having done that, I could do, I can, I can handle moving into China. That's totally doable. Um, but also because I mean, I, I quite, I feel quite, um, not, I feel quite, um, I fit, I feel I fit, I, I, I feel quite comfortable. I'm sorry to put it this way. I feel quite comfortable. Um, from the day I got here, it's been pretty easy for me to, to adjust. Um, and, um, while I did, um, uh, kind of screw up a few things here and there in terms of, um, uh, of, of developing the uh, Kendo organization, not being uh, uh, not understanding well enough the some of the uh, cultural or socioeconomic um, realities here. Um, I, I I don't think um, I've I don't think the the cultural uh, difference. Uh, between Trinidad and Tobago and say the rest of the world or Canada or Japan, I think, don't think the difference has influenced much um, my um, approach to teaching or to developing Kendo here. Um, I, I don't like uh, to, um, you know, a lot of uh, students of mine say, you know, oh, well, we're different. It's the culture. I don't. I don't quite like saying that. I think culture is, you know, it's an easy excuse. You know, put everything on the back of culture. It's not so much. You know, the the challenges that that I've had, in, that we've had in in developing the organization here. I, I don't think it's so much culture as socioeconomic environment. Um, now, it's true that Trinidad and Tobago has a unique culture. Um, it's true that. Um, um, the discipline and the patience and the um, focus required to develop in kendo and, and many other martial arts uh, doesn't quite fit uh, the natural mentality here. Um, but um, you could say that of every country. Um, it may be more so here in Trinidad because, I mean, if you've been in the Caribbean, you know, you know, it's so damn hot. You kind of have to slow down a little bit. Um, maybe that's why. But the point is, the, the 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 pace is far slower here as it is in certainly North America. So you don't come in here with uh, you know your great ideas of revolutionizing the the Kendo world by by pushing hard, hard, hard. You kind of have to adjust a little bit. Uh, so, so yeah, okay, culture a little bit, but but mostly, you know, the life here is not all that easy for everybody. I'm lucky enough that I have a good job, and my wife has a good job, and we're comfortable from that perspective. But I, I would, I know that for most of my students over the years, it's not necessarily the case. So most of the um, um, students uh, join when they're in their um, early 20s, let's say. Either they've already graduated from school and they're in the workplace, um, they're in university and graduating soon. And so they're at that stage in their lives where they starting to um, to uh, to organize their lives and getting married and whatnot. And um, so issues of work, money, family, uh, you know, priorities become far more uh, complicated at that age. All the more so here in Trinidad, because um, because money is um, is is an issue. Um, the country is a rich country, but the money doesn't necessarily flow through all all um, layers of the society. Uh, so a lot of my students uh, have a couple of jobs, two jobs. Um, go to uh, classes at night to complement uh, their job, whether that's a degree or MBA or whatnot, just to kind of keep up. Um, some, a lot of them work and the, the money they make is for the whole family. I mean, extended family, parents, brothers, sisters, and so on. So, so that puts a lot of pressure on them. And as a result, uh, Kendo very often is kind of a, not far from being at the center of their lives. It's quite peripheral, that's the right word. 
Um, and that's what has been the biggest challenge here. It's the the attendance and the, or lack thereof, or lack of uh, constant, constant attendance. And it's caused mainly by that, I believe. It's not because anybody's lazy here. Um, everybody are, to the same extent, it's the same everywhere else. You know, there's certainly in Kendo, many days where you know you have a practice at night and you're like, I don't want to go, I'm so tired. I, I feel, I felt it myself in many environments around wherever I've lived. So I know it's the same here. So that's not the difference. So it's a lot more the, um, the, uh, the realities of the target audience that I, that I, that I picked to start with. So it's expected. Um, but I kind of lost track of where, what your question was, but essentially, uh, yeah, I think, I think from, uh, if you're looking at a cultural thing, um, that would influence the, um, the growth here or my, or my teaching here, um, it's just really recognizing the socioeconomic environment. Yeah, and so far we've talked about just the challenges of getting students to commit to the practice and get better. But then there's also the issue with creating an organization because usually the people that are involved in organizing stuff or administrative stuff are people that have already dedicated a lot of their time to the practice, enjoy it, and want to do even more. So they have even more time on their hands. So if they can't even find time to actually come regularly to practice, how have you been able to build any sort of structure around the around this part in the country? Yeah, so that, that's obviously an important aspect. Um, so I've, I've been lucky there. A lot of my students have uh, stepped forward and, and, and seen, you know, the effort I've put in the first few years and they're at a stage in their life where they can spend a little bit of time helping out, whether that's in um, accounting or um, website management or Facebook marketing or things like that. So um, I think I think the important part is first to to um, to have these things in place. So I was the one initially who got a website up, and I was the one who registered the company or the nonprofit company. I was the one who did all of that. But these things have to be in place. Don't you don't think about that when you're dropped in the middle of a an island teaching. You, those are not things. But but I had to do it. So I had to do that and I had to look at, okay, how, if, if our objective is to, to grow the organization and promote it, then there needs to be a vehicle to promote it. So Facebook and whatnot. Um, and, and then you have to hand over the keys. You have to be willing to hand over the keys to people who step forward and say, I'm, okay, I want to help. So that is a big thing. It's a hard thing. Fortunately, as I say, I was lucky that there were people who were competent uh, professionally competent and they were, they were able to help and they're still able to help. So I don't have to worry too much about that. Um, the, um, the, 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 it's been a lot harder on the teaching side, on the curriculum side. Uh, I'm at that stage still of trying to coach people up to a point where they can, they can teach, uh, themselves. Um, and that's the next uh, phase of growth. I mean, from an organizational standpoint, I mean, it's not that hard. I mean, uh, granted, I've had a lot of experience in setting up business or companies. So I, I get a sense of how what's required to make it work. But starting a, a, an organization like a dojo or a national, national uh, kendo organization is really not that hard. Uh, it's populating it and growing it that's a lot more difficult. Um, so at this stage, our, our um, goal, I mean, my goal initially was to set a baseline of uh, the foundation of the organization. That's done. Uh, a, a foundation of um, qualified people. Well, we're there. We're almost there. Certainly, um, you know, there's a few uh, Nidan, Sandan in the organization. So from a Kendo perspective, it's kind of there. Um, despite the challenges of attendance and, 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 and you know, uh, that, that, those kind of points that I mentioned earlier. Um, but uh, it's, it's got, it has reached a plateau, as in how far can you go teaching adults? So the objective that we had uh, put in place and already started exactly a year ago 
uh, well, that was put on the back burner because of COVID, was to teach kids. So um, we were lucky enough. So police approached me to teach kids in the police uh, uh, police youth youth groups. Um, so so that's one of the next avenues is, is to teach kids, and to do that. So fortunately, my work allows me more freedom in terms of time. So I'm going to spend more time doing that. But uh, I do depend on uh, other. Uh, students to help me get to a point where they can become instructors. So that's the, my next next focus is build up uh, instructors to teach kids because that's a whole other ballgame. It's not the same thing. And that that is essentially uh, avoiding these students that I brought up, avoid, making sure they understand that they shouldn't teach the kids the way they were taught. Because what we spoke earlier of is, you know, they, they learn from me at an age where they were in a space, in a place and time where they were, well, it's different for kids who are eight, nine, and 10 years old. So you have to kind of think through that and create a curriculum that's appropriate and um, apply it correctly. So that, that's really the next, uh, the next stage there. Yeah, I certainly see that in Canada, especially the, the dojos that are really has like, for me, and like this is my opinion, but has a really bright future are the ones that have been focusing on kids, whether it's JCCC, Etobicoke, and I see some in Vancouver. The ones that, um, because my daughter just recently started as well, she's six, and I was like, yeah, the, the senseis are clearly making it clear to the adults that the focus of this class or this part of the, uh, the day or the week is on the kids. So we want to bring them in. We want to make sure they're enjoyed. Yes, you might not be pushed as hard as you want, but like this is what we need to. to yeah, I'm, I'm uh, at this stage, I'm, I'm heavily influenced by um, uh, Ariga Sensei in, in California. Um, well, at many levels, but uh, certainly from the kids' perspective, I mean, haven't been there. Every year I go there for the uh, Gashku that he's organizing. And um, I, I've realized, you know, when you have 50 kids that learn, you don't have to worry about attendance, about adults and things like that. You know that that 50 or 20 or 30 will eventually feed into, uh, you know, uh, a pipeline, if you may, of, 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 of qualified people down the road. So, so that's the only way you survive. And, and, and I am, I guess, at a stage, uh, at an age where I have to start thinking, okay, what comes next? You know, what's my legacy here? Um, because, you know, uh, I, I, I can't, um, everything cannot depend on me. It just doesn't make any sense. And, um, yeah, so, so I've, I've had to, uh, to, to, to make that decision interesting because I've always avoided teaching kids because I know how hard it is and I know the effort you need to put in place to, to do it properly. Uh, so I've said no for 15 years, but now, now is the time to do it. And, and, and we're going to do it right. And we're going to, you know, that, that's what's exciting is, is knowing that um, the kids here will become really, really good at it. You know, I've, I've experienced it already. Um, I did a few, uh, few months teaching kids that are in a high school and down in the middle of nowhere. And they were amazing. You know, it's like never seen anything like this. Um, so I look forward to that in the, in the sense that I know that, you know, give me 10 years teaching a bunch of kids of a school or a couple of schools, five or 10 schools, if so much, and we're going to create, you know, a, a very, very significant, um, uh, very significantly competitive um, kendoka, for sure. You know, you... The the uh, the the athletics, uh, you know, the, 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 those who ra who win races in the Olympics are from the Caribbean, right? And there's a reason for that. They are really strong, men and women. So so that's yeah, it's it's a warning to to North America. Watch out for, for Trinidad in a few years, kendo wise. Yeah, that that's amazing. And this has been a wonderful conversation. You're the exact type of person that I want to have on this podcast because it, it really is your journey through kendo has mirrored what everyone will experience in life which is you start out 
focusing on yourselves. You, you, you want to just be the best person you can as a youth. Then you become a little more mature. You have to start taking on responsibility. And then now you're on trying to pass it on to the next generation. And it's so clear that not everyone has these realizations, these turning points. People leave and people stay in, but then still focus on themselves. And you've really showed that transformation um, as a practitioner and then as a teacher and then that, like as, as a leader. So this is really the type of story I, I want to the, the, um The other side of all of this is, is what happens to your own development, my development, right? And that's, that's been um, quite a real challenge. Um, and, and, and anybody who, who um, you speak to that's, you know, I know you've spoken to some of my uh, friends in the Latin American countries. They'll tell you the same thing. It's you're in a position to you're forced. You're you're, you're kind of you know responsible, and if if you if you were taught properly, you feel the responsibility to teach, even if you're shodan or nidan or sandan, and you're incompetent. You kind of have to to help develop the the organization. And uh, so, but the problem is, uh, who teaches you? Who keeps you in check? How do you develop and, and grow? And, and that has been uh, really, really difficult. And, and that is what uh, I think requires a lot of self-discipline. Um, so to, to, to make it very tangible, you see, I, I, think I passed uh, my third done before coming here. I passed my fourth done a few years um, after I moved here. And it took... Uh, 10 years before I was able to pass my fifth down. Now, granted, in Kendo, both the fifth down, certainly here, it's quite a step. There's quite a lot of... Uh, it's it's a big step, let's put it this way. And But not only 10 years, but I stopped counting, but I must have failed my exam nine or 10 times, easily. And that's simply because I was not able to learn by myself. Um, or to, to phrase it properly, it's, I wasn't able to learn without a sensei looking over my shoulder and guiding me, right? Uh, but because you're not by yourself. I was not by myself. And it's when I realized that, that I started improving. So, but it, it requires a lot of discipline and a lot of, um, you know, you have to look at yourself and say, okay, what, so if you do exams and if you do you participate in events and you get your backside handed over to you every time you gotta well, why is that and you have to so you gotta identify your your weaknesses early on otherwise you you have no chance especially higher higher grades um, and so I, I think it took me a long while to to realize that um, essentially. Passing my grades all the way to fourth dan was just a fluke. Uh, I was I was good, maybe athletically and physically. I was competent, but I had no idea. I had no idea what I was doing. Um, it's it's only when I last few years that I realized, oh boy, okay, I didn't know what I didn't know really. And and I, it's only when I started um, training harder, thinking harder, attending more events. Then I realize, okay, now I realize what I don't know, and let's work on it. So that's what it takes. Um, and if you don't have that, if you kind of rely on you know, the sensei syndrome, you know, you're you're teaching people who look at you thinking, oh, you, you know, you're so good, you're so awesome, but you're really not that good. It's easy to just stay there and just pose and pretend, and then your candle just drops and you, you'll never get to nothing so you have to kind of be quite humble about it and uh find ways to to get out of it find ways to to, to improve and so that's uh that's a, a huge challenge a huge challenge for everybody who's been put in that position just a quickly if i can ask you a couple of those rapid fire questions before we wrap sure. up this uh hopefully first of multiple rounds uh, first question would be, uh, what have you changed your mind over in the last few years? Something that you used to believe was true, now it's false, or something that you believe strongly was one way, but now you realize that you were missing something? Um, uh, that you can learn 
um, even if you are the um, senior member in the dojo, that you have many, many ways you could still learn. You're not lost. You can find ways to learn, to improve, even with people who are far less uh, experienced as you are when you practice with them. And your job is to find that. And the next question kind of leads in from that is, how do you record what you've learned? How do you know for sure? Um, how do you measure whether or not you have actually learned something or you're improving? Um, I, uh, that's a good question. I don't really do that, but I do measure myself. So I guess every, every year I, I attend a Gashku in California. And I test whether or not what I've worked on for the year has worked or not. So I take a very long-term approach and see how it goes. So you mentioned traveling and you've been to a lot of different places. Do you have like an essential item that you always have to bring with you that you find is, um, even if you're packed light, you, it's a necessary thing you have to bring? I was going to say, every time I travel for work or family, I, there's one item I bring is my gin mahakama, and I find a way to practice wherever I go in the world. Okay, yeah, that works too. Um, next question is, if you were to, if someone were to log into your YouTube account, because YouTube recommends videos based on what you most often watch, so if you watch a lot of cat videos, it'll recommend you more cat videos, what would someone see as YouTube recommending to you most? A mix of uh, kendo-related videos with new tech, with music, and some uh, SpaceX stuff, probably. Are there any particular channels you're subscribed to that you like to go to often? Uh, on the kendo side, yes, um, I am. I follow uh, Okada Sensei's uh, Kendo Innovation Lab um, channel. I quite like what he says. Uh, unfortunately, it's in Japanese, so if you don't speak Japanese, you're tough. So uh, I have a lot of interest in sailing, being in the Caribbean. So I sail. I have a boat. I have a lot of interest in uh, triathlon because I've been doing triathlons and I'm trying to get back into it. Uh, a lot of interest in uh, tech because that's what kind of that's kind of business that I that I work in. Um, I I have a uh, data science uh, machine learning organization that I'm putting in place. That's cool. Next time I have to ask you how. AI will change how we practice kendo and martial arts in the future. That's a good question indeed. Uh, and then the last question before we get to wrap up is, because this is a podcast, I was just wondering, if you listen to podcasts, do you have any suggestions or things that you like to listen to? Um, yeah, I do listen to quite a lot of podcasts. Um, well, to be honest with you, I was not familiar with yours, and I've started listening to it to it because I find the format quite interesting. Um, so that's one good recommendation I can make. Um, one thing I've listened to, which is interesting, is a History of Japan podcast. Um, I forget the name of the guy that does it, but he... He's an academic who does the does a weekly podcast, I think, History of Japan, really interesting. Um, otherwise, in terms of podcasts, what's on my list here that's not uh, AI or ML is um, kind of left-leaning American politics stuff. So, yeah, but uh, History of Japan, check it out. It's really good. Cool. Yeah, thank you. All right, so thank you so much for taking time to, to share your story. And, and there's a lot of interesting topics that I'd love to follow up with you in the future um, and just to see how Trinidad and Tobago is developing in terms of kendo. Do you have anything in closing that you want to say to the audience just to leave us with a message from your little part of the world? Um, well, thank you, first of all, for, um, for inviting me to this. Um, 
if you want to come over here and have a nice holiday, um, reach out to me. Um, we also do kendo. <laughs> Um, and the candle's pretty good, pretty fun. So check out Candle Trinidad on the Facebook page. You'll see the whole history of what we've done and what we're going, where, we, where we're going. So thank you so much. All right. Cool. Thanks, Patrick. Have a great day. All right. Same to you. See you.